For God's Sake, Grow Up, A Call to Spiritual Maturity by David Ravenhill Chapter 2 Understanding the Purpose of the Cross For more than 14 years, my family and I lived in New Zealand, a home to some of the world's most spectacular scenery. While driving its winding roads, it was not unusual to pass a beautiful vintage auto automobile dating back 50 or 75 years. Owners labored for untold hours at a great expense, restoring these cars to their original condition. Nothing was overlooked in the process. Every part had to be painstakingly checked, stripped, repaired, or replaced before being fitted back together. The Importance of Authenticity Imagine with me a man who stumbles across one of these cars in the back of a farmer's shed. For the sake of our story, let's say it's a 1913 Model T. Realizing the car's potential if restored, the man offers the farmer some cash and becomes the proud owner of what was once a beautiful car. Eager to see the car restored, the man spends every spare minute working on it. The weeks turn into months, but every day he sees a little more improvement. There's a problem, however. You see, this fellow has never seen a 1913 Model T in its original condition, so he has no idea what it should look like. His knowledge of cars is largely governed by today's standards and styles. Determined to restore the car as quickly and inexpensively as possible, the new owner settles for readily available parts. Rather than checking out the manufacturer's specifications for the original wheel hubs and road wheels, he simply buys some mag wheels with wide tires. Rather than using the specified brass-plated headlights and lamps, he settles for some small square halogen ones. Instead of using a vintage-style dashboard and firewall crafted in wood veneer, he substitutes plastic and anything else he can make fit. Rather than upholstering the seats in genuine leather, he settles for a bright plaid fabric, and so it goes for every single thing he restores. Eventually, the wonderful day comes when the car is finished. The owner proudly drives around town displaying his achievement. As the fellow rides past his retirement complex, he notices an elderly man rise from a rocking chair on the front porch, staring in disbelief. Supposing that the old gentleman has been overcome by nostalgia, the owner wheels the car into the driveway and invites the man to look the car over and tell him what he thinks. Imagine his shock and disappointment as the old man shuffles slowly around the car, scratches his head, and says, I used to own one of these, young fellow, so I know what I'm talking about. This car looks nothing like the original model. Christians today are like that sincere but naive car buff. Unknowingly, we have settled for a cheap imitation of the real gospel. I am convinced that if we were to meet a first century believer, he or she would stare, us, stare at us in disbelief. Although we probably call, call ourselves Christians, I am afraid that we are far, we're a far cry from the genuine Christianity described in the owner's manual, the Word of God. The Need for Balance there is nothing so likely to lead to error or heresy as to start with the parts rather than the whole, said Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones. Wouldn't that every believer understood the importance of that profound observation? Never before has the church been so bombarded with such an infinite variety of, of parts. A visit to the local Christian bookstore will reveal an almost limit, limitless variety of top, topics, each vying for your attention and money. The shelves are sagging under the weight of new books. Everything from diets to depression and fitness to faith. No wonder the average believer has little sense of direction or purpose. Ignorant of the whole purpose of God, he stands bewildered among the parts. For many, the local church has become an alternative to the country club. Membership is easily gained through baptism and tithing. 
few ever stop to ponder the reason for the church's existence. Content to attend a bare minimum of meetings, these believers settle into apathy and boredom, indifferent to their true purpose and calling. As if indifference and apathy are not enough to hinder most Christians on the road to maturity, strange winds of doctrine are also blowing all about us. Every year it seems a new seminar superstar arrives center stage with his guaranteed formula for spiritual success. Backed with slick advertising, glossy manuals, and dynamic personalities, these self-anointed oracles of wisdom convince many immature believers as they at long last have discovered the answer to all believers' spiritual problems. The promised results of such programs are usually short-lived. God never intended the part to replace the whole. If we're going to press toward maturity, we desperately need to return to rightly dividing the Word of God. Only the whole counsel of God produces whole Christians. Anything less results in spiritual deformity. Carburetor Christianity Suppose someone is giving a lecture series to a group of students totally unfamiliar with how an automobile engine works. But the instructor, rather than presenting an overall view, chooses to concentrate solely upon the importance of the carburetor. First, he draws a diagram showing how a carburetor operates and what function it performs. Then he spends hours explaining every detail of its makeup, from the air cleaner to the jets. Next, the instructor painstakingly describes the various types of carburetors, the one-barrel, two-barrel, and four-barrel. Finally, he closes his lectures by emphasizing once again how vital the carburetor is. After all, without it, the engine cannot possibly run. The hearers, still unfamiliar with the other components of an engine, leave the classroom preaching the gospel of the carburetor. Meanwhile, across town, another group listens attentively to a series of lectures on the role of the spark plug. Great detail is given as to its essential function. Diagrams are shown explaining exactly how the spark plug works. This lecture also closes with a strong emphasis on the vital role played by one particular part of the engine, stressing that without the spark plug, it is powerless and unable to run. Now we have a new group proclaiming the gospel of the spark plug. Later, another group forms, extolling the virtues of the distributor. Not only do they claim its absolute, absolute necessity, they also begin to preach against the carburetor and spark plug. According to them, the distributor is the one and only true gospel. Similar teaching in the body of Christ has caused believers to become unbalanced and unwise, lacking the whole counsel of God. Congregations and followings form around these various parts, convinced that they have the ultimate and complete truth, and shunning all those who refuse to join them. Paul faced a similar situation with the Corinthians. Not only were their loyalties divided, some claiming allegiance to Paul, some to Apollos, and others to Christ, but they also stressed their own particular function without regard to the other parts of their body. The eyes were proud of their insight, the hands of their service, the feet of their support. How desperately we need a new understanding of God's eternal, omnipotent and perspective. The church is being swamped with wave upon wave of popular appealing doctrines. Few want to hear about tribulation, discipline, sacrifice, or suffering. While the church grows fat, lazy, and indifferent to its real role in the earth, every year new advances are seen in the enemy's strategy. Islam continu continues to forge ahead with its militant zeal for world domination. Cults increase, preying upon those who are thirsting for enlightenment, are content to drink from polluted springs. Understanding God's original purpose. If we were... We are to correct our gross errors and deficiencies. The church must gain an understanding of mind of God from the beginning. What was God's intention for mankind? 
Why did he create us in the first place? Only as we begin to comprehend the answers to those questions, we can grasp the full significance of the cross. Paul, in his epistle to the Colossians, writes, For by him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. All things were created by him and for him. Most of us have little trouble believing God created everything, but when it comes to understanding we were created for him, we tend to feel our sovereignty is being threatened. In the book of Revelation, John sheds further light on this vital truth. Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power, for thou hast created all things, and for thy pleasure they are and were created. These two verses offer invaluable insight, valuable insight into God's purpose in creating man. We were made for him. We were created for his pleasure and purpose. Before we seek a deeper understanding of the cross, it will be necessary first of all to study man in his original state before the fall. We read in Genesis, Then the Lord God took the man and put him into the Garden of Eden to cultivate it and keep it. Immediately we notice three areas included in God's intention for man. One, man's submission. The Lord God took man. Two, man's location. Put him into the garden. And three, man's vocation. To cultivate it and keep it. Man, as God intended, was originally under submission to his divine authority. He was placed in the location of God's choice and given the vocation that God intended him to have in order to serve his purpose. Clearly then we see man created, not only by God but for God. There is no thought here of man determining his own course of action. Only after the fall do we see man living in independence, having turned to pursue his own way. Isaiah capsulizes this when he states all of us like sheep have gone astray each of us has turned to his own way isaiah 53 6 with this background we can proceed with our understanding of the cross as it relates to god's intention for man perhaps our greatest error stems from the fact that we have failed to grasp god's purpose for man from the beginning Because we are now governed by self-interest, our understanding of the cross has been distorted. Hence, the cross becomes God's answer to my need. Our immediate response to the cross is, what can I get out of it? What has the death of Christ accomplished for me? Why did Christ die? Over the years, as I've ministered in various foreign countries, I've repeatedly asked the question, Why did Jesus die? Yes, Christ died to atone for sin. But was that the only purpose? Let me use an illustration to help deepen our understanding of why Christ died. Suppose, for example, my wife and I have lived without transportation for many years. Finally, we saved enough money to buy our first car. After days of shopping around, I settled on an automobile I believed to be suitable for our needs. The car, while in reasonable mechanical order, is far from tidy. The years and miles have taken their toll. Happily though, as I drive it home and begin to and and I begin cleaning it up. As I remove the seats I find a thick layer of grime and an assortment of lost coins and toys. The outside proves to be even more of a challenge. The paint has faded Dust, dirt, and tar have laid claim to the finish. But slowly the grime is washed away, and a new coat of polish brings a welcome shine. Now at last the car begins to reveal something of her former glory. Upon finishing the job, I walk into the house and proudly display to my wife my bucket of filthy water. Look at all this dirt, honey, I exclaim. See what all our hard work has accomplished? Well, obviously something is terribly wrong. Nobody in his right mind would give all he had simply for a bucket of dirty water. 
My intention in buying the cart was not its grime, but the car itself. The reason I gave all that I had was because I needed the car. I purchased it as my own to serve my purpose. Let's take my car illustration even further and assume I had bought the car years before when it was brand new, ordering it special from the factory with a custom paint job and unique set of accessories. This car had been created just for me. Then, somehow over the years, we had parted, and the car had been abused and neglected. Now, at last, I have found my car. I buy it back and go about the difficult task of cleaning and restoring. Although the illustration is far from perfect, it conveys a popular misconception about the cross. To most of us, the death of Christ served only one purpose, to wash the filth of sin from our lives. Yet I'm not convinced God is so interested in our sin. The Bible says, As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. God obviously is not in the business of collecting sins. The Cross for man's benefit and God's benefit. What then was his objective in going to the cross? As we search the scriptures along these lines, we discover a twofold objective, one for man's benefit, another for God's. <clears throat> As I studied the scriptures throughout the years, I have made a point to mark the verses dealing with the cross. Paul, in his epistle to the Romans, reveals the full meaning of Christ's death when he writes, For not one of us lives for himself, and not one dies for himself. For if we live, we live for the Lord, or if we die, we die for the Lord. Therefore, whether we live or die, we are the Lord's. For to this end Christ died and lived again, that he might be Lord both of the dead and of the living. Romans fourteen seven through 9 Paul stresses that Christ's death was not merely for sin, but, for, but to once again establish his lordship over our lives. In his writings to Titus, Paul further clarifies this. Who gave himself for us, that he might redeem us from every lawless deed, and purify for himself a people for his own possession, zealous for the good deeds. Titus 2.14 Notice the two aspects of Christ's death. Paul beautifully ties together both man's benefit and God's intention. Man receives forgiveness and cleansing. However, Paul goes on to show that God desires for man for himself as his own possession. It is man, then, that God has in mind, not just his sin. Further proof of this is shown in the book of Revelation, where John sets forth the objective of Christ's death. Worthy art thou to take the book and to break its seals, for thou wast slain and didst purchase for God with thy blood men from every tribe and tongue and people and nation. These and other scriptures cast fresh light on the cross and the divine intention of God from the beginning. We desperately need a fresh emphasis on the Lordship of Christ. For too long we have ministered an easy believism message that places no demands whatsoever upon the believer, other than a trip to the altar, a quick prayer, and the promise to tithe. Apart from this, we encourage new converts to keep clean and await the rapture. The Old Cross and the New a. W. Tozer, in his indomitable way, sums up the problem when he speaks of the old cross and the new. Unannounced and largely undetected, there has come in modern times a new cross into popular evangelical circles. It is like the old cross, but while likenesses are superficial, the differences are fundamental. From this new cross has sprung a new philosophy of the Christian life and from the new philosophy has come a new evangelical technique, a, type, a new type of meeting, and a new kind of preaching. This new evangelism employs the same language as the old, but its content and emphasis differ. The old cross would have no truck with the world. For Adam's proud flesh, it meant the end of the journey, 
and carried into effect the sentence imposed by the law of Sinai. The new cross, in contrast, is not opposed to our flesh. It is a friendly pal, a source of oceans of good, clean fun, and innocent enjoyment. It lets Adam live without interference. His life motivation is unchanged. He still lives for his own pleasure, but now he takes delight in singing worship choruses and watching religious movies instead of singing body songs and drinking hard liquor. The accent is still on enjoyment, though the fun is now on a high plane morally, if not intellectually. The new cross encourages a new and entirely different evangelistic approach. The evangelist does not demand a surrendering surrendering of the old life before the new life can be received. He preaches similarities rather than contrasts. He seeks to create more interest in the gospel by showing that Christianity makes no unpleasant demands. His brand of Christianity offers the same things the world does, only at a higher level. Whatever the sin-mad world happens to be clamoring after that, that moment, is cleverly shown to be the very thing the gospel offers, only the religious version is better. The new cross does not slay the sinner, it redirects him. It steers him into a cleaner and jollier way of living and saves his self-respect. To the self-assertive, it says, come and assert yourself to, for Christ. To the egotist, it says, come and do your boasting in the Lord. To the thrill seeker, it says, come and enjoy the thrill of success through Christ. Having been guilty of tampering with the truth, we need to return to the ancient landmarks and repent of our failings. One of the clearest verses regarding the cross is given to Paul's letter to the Corinthians. I believe that this is the most concise statement in all of the Bible regarding the death of Christ. And he died for all, that they who live shall no longer live for themselves, but for him who died and rose again on their behalf. Second Corinthians 5.15 Revolutionizing our reason for being. Jesus' death was to revolutionize our whole purpose in life. It was to mark the end of selfish living and put on a roadblock in front of of all plans and purposes, old things were to pass away, a new ministry and purpose were to begin. See Second Corinthians five seventeen through eighteen. And yet so many in the church still live for themselves. Certain habit patterns have ceased. No longer do they continue to practice their former sins, but the root of self has never died. Their plans remained unchanged. They live for themselves, the very purpose which Christ died to destroy. I know all about living for one's own selfish plans and purposes. You see, as a young person, before becoming a Christian, I dreamed of becoming a graphic artist. Being reared in a Christian home and having a father who was a well-known preacher, I grew up hearing the claims of Christ. Although I knew I was a sinner and longed for the assurance of salvation, I resisted the gentle promptings of the Spirit for many years. Finally, at the age of 18, I surrendered my life to Christ. For three years before this, there were times when I would literally shake under the Spirit's conviction, yet I refused to respond. Why? Somehow the Holy Spirit had made me aware that God was after more than just my sin. He wanted me. Not being prepared to give up my life and plans, I resisted, until finally I gave myself unreservedly to Him. A portion of scripture that has become increasingly real to me over the years says, You are not your own. You have been bought with a price. Notice again the purpose behind the cross. You, not simply your sins, have been bought. Paul testifies, Who loved me and delivered himself up for me. That was Galatians 2.20, emphasis the authors. God desires us. By now we can begin to see something of the purpose of the cross. Far more is at stake than just our sins. God desires mankind, those created by him and for him. Herein lies the weakness of much of our modern preaching and teaching. 
No wonder the church, which is his body, lacks the zeal of its first love. No wonder thousands pass daily into a Christless eternity while the church slumbers unconcerned. How well Paul understood the words, You are not your own. He was made aware of the moment of his con conversion. When he cried, What shall I do, Lord? The Lord answered, Arise and go in Damascus, and there you will be told of all the th that I have appointed for you to do. See Acts 9 6. The word Lord implies submission. The command go into Damascus de designates location. The instructions, and there you will be told of all that is has been appointed for you to do, indicates vocation. How we need to return to the biblical basics of conversion. The easy believism of today has produced a weak, pathetic church constantly in need of spiritual prep-me-up to keep it going. The average believer lives as an enemy of the cross, refusing its demands but expecting to enjoy its privileges. Paul makes reference to these when he writes, For many walk of whom I often told you, and now tell you even weeping, that they are enemies of the cross of Christ, who set their minds on earthly things. Philippians 3, 18, 19. They are absorbed in earthly matters, and this world is the limit of their horizon. Where are the men and women today who know the joy of full surrender? Who are the people who grow up past spiritual infancy to be mature in Christ? Those prepared to follow the Lamb whithersoever he goeth. <clears throat> Those prepared to forsake all and follow him. Those who genuinely seek first the kingdom of God. Those who can say with Paul, the things that are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. Those whose response is, I delight to do thy will. Those of whom the world was not worthy. Those who count not their lives as dear to themselves. Those whose goal is to hear him say, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Only as we begin to study the scriptures afresh, do we begin to see how much of the church remains in spiritual infancy. I was alarmed some years ago to read Peter's warning. But false prophets also arose among the people, just as there will also be false teachers among you, who will secretly introduce destructive heresies, even denying the master who bought them, bringing swift destruction upon themselves. 2 Peter 2 1. Notice Peter's warning of a teaching that will gradually creep into the church. The end result. Notice Peter's warning of a teaching that will gradually creep into the church, the end result of which will deny Christ the lordship over those he has purchased, those whom he created for himself. It would appear that this is simply another way of saying, We will not have this man reign over us. Crucify him. We accepted his provision of forgiveness, but we deny him the right to enlist us in his purpose. In view of all this, should we respond? Maturity requires surrender. First, we need to present ourselves unreservedly to the, to the Lord in total surrender. The cross represents death, death to our own desires, plans, ambitions, and goals. The cross is final and complete. Second, now that we are dead to self, we need to live for Christ. In order to fulfill this, we need to ask, Lord, what will you have me to do? James, in his epistle, warns, Look here, you people, who say, Today or tomorrow we are going to such and such a city, stay there a year, and open up a profitable business. How do you know what is going to happen tomorrow? For the length of your lives is as certain as the morning fog. Now you see it, soon it is gone. What ought what you ought to say is, if the Lord wants us to, we shall live and do this or that. Otherwise, you will be, 
you will be bragging about your own plans. And such confidence never pleases God. Remember, too, that knowing what is right to do and then not doing it is sin. James 4, 13 through 17. It is only when we recognize that we were created by Him and for Him and then respond by giving ourselves back to Him that we can find and fulfill the purpose for which we were created. Only then can we become authentic replicas of him in whose image we were created.